Broken Strings. I don't want to live past 84, Julia declared. Well beyond middle age now, that would give her maybe 20 years, more. Did she mean life wouldn't get much better than this? Food stamps, Medicaid, the per diem pay of a nurse's aid job, a drafty one-bedroom rental in an isolated farmhouse in a desolate Pennsylvania state park, heat being costly, a rickety electric heater in each room, sparingly used. At some point, I decided to call myself a fiber artist, she told me, and why not? Julia was drawn to the richness of textiles and had a creative instinct for transforming raw sheep's wool, for example, into a vest or pair of gloves, and all by her own design. Once, in the early, heady days of our friendship, she designed a silk shawl and velvet pillow cover for me. She did that as only a cherished friend could, to console me, for it was a dark time. We were in our mid-20s then, in 1980s crack-ridden Washington Heights, a world away from the city where we first met as conservatory violin students, building finger calluses and endurance while honing our craft, only to find our musical ideals shunned by the world's cold shoulder. Looking back, I think our friendship was, to a large extent, fueled by our common misery. I met Julia when I was 19 and was immediately drawn to her, wanted to emulate her. She represented everything my suburban Catholic upbringing did not. The daughter of an artist, she once nonchalantly mentioned that she was raised in a home where nudity was an ordinary, commonplace way of life. I was intrigued, coming from a home where the body was a source of shame to be covered up and hidden. Julia's sculpted cheekbones, vintage dress, and tragic bearing captivated me. She was an only child whose father, an alcoholic-ridden an alcohol -ridden violist and painter, and workaholic mother, divorced when Julia was five. At 22, she already seemed weary by the weight of the world, yet toughened at the same time. She wasn't about to let the world and men in particular, mess with her. At a party, I'd observe her with a sense of awe and a faint tinge of jealousy. She was all femme fatale and cigarette smoke. Men were drawn to her like magnets. But with me, she was all vulnerability, and it was mutually so. And that vulnerability poured into her violin playing. Her sound, just before the point of breaking, evoked heartache. It took hard work to achieve that sound, several hours a day of solitary practice, overcoming technical obstacles and chasing perfection. And eventually, that perfection goddess became a curse. In her late 30s, Julia developed tendonitis, and at 41, it forced her to put the violin down forever. Our paths had diverged by then, but I never forgot her. In fact, she haunted my dreams all these years to the point where, a quarter of a century later, I had to find her. Time was running out, and the thought of never seeing her again was intolerable. And so there sat Gina before me on a bleak Pennsylvania March day while the electric heater's meager warmth did its best to dispel the living room chill. The chiseled cheekbones had filled in, and that cigarette smoke, once so alluring and romantic, had sallowed her face somehow. For more warmth, she offered me one of her sheep's wool vests to wear, a hearty bowl of chili, and a steaming cup of tea. She may never have been one to stand on verbal overtures of sentimentality, but I was somehow touched as she pours boiled water over green tea leaves. I tried not to notice the slight tremor in her hand or her, around her mouth when she spoke. My eyes scanned the living room, 
fiber art designs hung on clotheslines. Colorful spools of wool yarn were tucked snugly on shelves in a corner. Julia had sold her violin, shutting one door for good, but had replaced it with another equally truthful creative act. When it was time to leave, she walked me to my car in the circular driveway. I caught one last glimpse of her through the rear view mirror and waved. Her hand, tremulous yet still vital, waved back against the gray March sky. Oh, beautiful.